I can, I can be a leader exactly where I'm at. I can influence, uh, people and, and instruct people exactly where I am. I don't have to be, have a title to exactly do that. Welcome to the Men's Alliance podcast. Men's Alliance is a growing movement of tribes across the nation that meet weekly for rugged outdoor workouts and a real world devotion around a fire. If you want to be a part of what we're doing, join us at mensalliancetribe.com where you can find a tribe near you or come to one of our Start the Fire weekends. So check us out at mensalliancetribe.com. Now stay tuned for this great podcast. Welcome to the Men's Alliance podcast. I'm Dave Mills Goose. And I'm Dusty Parker, Shadow. And with us today, we have Ian Enriquez, call sign Tech. Tech, welcome to the show, buddy. How's it going? What's up, man? So Tech is the tribe leader for Columbia Tribe, which is in Hermiston, Oregon. And yep. really excited about this for a lot of reasons, Tech. Um, excited about having you on the podcast. So one, because you're a tribe leader. And it's just great to hear from our tribe leaders. And uh, also because, I mean, you're Oregon, man. It's like Men's Alliance in Oregon. Got a couple tribes out there now. So it's good to hear from you guys and get some some West Coast representation. Yeah. I was, um, I was trying really hard not to be a, a tribe leader, but I kept looking for tribes <laughs> to pop up and just hope for, for one good one anywhere near me. Oh, man. I guess I got to do it. That's awesome. You know what? That right there. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that as because that that absolutely has to do with today's topic. Yeah. Um. So I'm really excited about this series. So so today is like the first of a five part series that we're going to be doing on leadership lessons from the series Band of Brothers. So if you've if you've never seen the TV series Band of Brothers, um, came out in I think it was O two. Um, on HBO and it's one of the best series that's ever been made. Seriously. It's, um, it's a 9.4 on IMDb and it's a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's one of the highest ranked shows ever made. And it's also absolutely historically accurate. It's one of my favorite things that attracted me to it originally is it's written by Stephen Ambrose. So Stephen Ambrose was a uh, professor of history. Um, He was at, um, I think he was at LSU uh, or or right around that area of uh, Louisiana. He taught for many years. He, he, he passed away around Oh four. I think it was Uh, great historian. He interviewed all these men firsthand, taking notes, recording all of their interviews to write the series band of brothers which is a history of Easy Company from the 101st Airborne Regiment during World War II. So it follows the men of Easy Company from their training in Toccoa, Georgia, um, through the Normandy invasion of D-Day, all the way through the Battle of the Bulge. And the series ends, spoiler alert, with us winning World War II and defeating the Nazis. So... It's a 10-part series. So what we're going to do during these podcasts is we're going to hear from five different tribe leaders from five different states, and we're going to be talking about the leadership lessons, the good examples, and the bad examples that we see from this series, Band of Brothers. So this is going to be fun. We're just talking about a TV show, but also it's it's extremely valuable because we're, we're uh, mining for leadership lessons. And when you watch Band of Brothers, man, they are everywhere. It is it's a crash course in leadership and and it's and it's in a, a really well put together way. It's a lot better than watching a lecture from a professor. So if you've never watched it, you gotta watch the series Band of Brothers. It's currently on Netflix. Better watch it before it goes away because right now you can watch all 10 episodes for free. So today, this being the first uh, installment of this leadership podcast series, we're going to be talking with Tech about episodes one and two. So, with that kind of setup out of the way, I want to kick things off 
by asking Tech, um, tell us about some of what you saw from episodes one and two of examples of, of great leadership. Let's just start there. Uh, as far as great leadership, uh, even at the very beginning, uh, you can you can see kind of the the battle between uh, Captain Sobel and um, what's his name? Winters. Uh, yeah, Winters. Um, and and seeing uh, kind of the kind of the jealousy and the different leadership styles that they both use. Um, I know Captain Sobel ends up like starting off with drawing all the men to really hate him. Um, and I mean, having that kind of like, uh, ability to, to get everybody on the same page is good at first. You, if you could harness that and use that, it, I've seen that work, but then you have to like really repair every kind of relationship afterwards. Um, uh, but I think probably one of the one of the best um, examples of good leadership is, in uh, episode one was as they kind of uh, Captain Sobel finds this one private to return and pick on and and decide that he wants this guy out uh, and tells him to run the hill uh, within fifty minutes, uh, Kurt uh, Kurt and as he's running it, you kind of see the the guys of his squad basically come up behind him and run alongside him. Um, so honestly, that that one right there is is uh, the best example of leadership in episode one. That is a powerful scene too. Yeah, like when that guy's being punished and made to run this like three mile mountain run, and then you see like all of his all of his buds running it coming up three, behind him three miles full gear and it is a steep hill yeah and they didn't have to they just did it you know because they weren't going to let their buddy uh get picked on and suffer alone one yep. of the things you said you mentioned jealousy and um that's such a toxic trait in a leader right so right off the bat there in that in episode one, you see these two leaders and one's, one's the leader because he has the title and the position and the rank. And the other guy is just emerging as the leader because he's a natural leader that men are drawn to. And the, and the first guy's getting jealous. And I think that's one of the first things that struck me shadow in this is, uh, is like a good leader is never jealous of another good leader or better leader that's under him and works for him. It's like, it's so true. A good leader. If you've got somebody that, that works with you or even under you and you start to recognize this guy's better than me. Mm -hmm. I think a good leader loves that. A good yeah. leader is like, Oh heck yes. This guy's going to help me. He's going to excel. He's going to make my life easier. And heck, he's probably going to surpass me yeah. uh, eventually. And you and, can pick up on that. Uh, Real quick, as a subordinate, if someone's like, "Okay, this dude's threatened by me," like <laughs> see, at least I can, hundred like, percent. This like, why is he? Because he starts picking on you for no good reason. Mm -hmm. It's just frustrating. And they, and they, you know, that jealous leader or, or an insecure leader would be another way to think of it, right? If you're yeah. an insecure leader, um, you're trying to like keep people around you down yeah trying to yeah. keep people from oh, excelling man. i have a great story about that all right um one of my first uh my first squad leaders and uh when i was in the fast teams he always he'd always tell you know the the platoon leader and the captain like give me all the i want all the problem kids i want you know he wanted his platoon full of the the dumb ones, you know, mm. his, his squad. And, and he tried to play it off. Like I want them because I'm going to turn, turn them into, you know, I'm going to train them harder and get them up to speed and all that. But you know, time tells like he wanted all the dumb ones. Cause he was an idiot. 
Like <laughs> he didn't want anybody smarter than him in his squad. And like you figure that out after a while. It's like he doesn't know anything. He doesn't want anybody that's going to – He doesn't want anybody him. that's going to outshine him. It's not because he just wants like, you know, to make the, the bad guys better. So it was just – it finally – uh, that finally came to light, and uh, he went away. That's a that. that is a crazy example yeah. of a guy that's like, see, he's recruiting, right? He's recruiting right. people that won't be able to tell he's a bad leader. Yep. Uh, so, Tech, what? Give us an example uh, from the from the show of a of a bad some bad leadership. What's a bad leadership moment? Um, I mean, we've already talked a little quite a bit about Captain Sobel and he uh he definitely shines through in, in both episode one and episode two. Um basically uh taking his frustrations and his finding ways to uh put down the only other person that would have been a good leader uh or a great leader at the time. And uh anytime he ends up messing up, he finds something to punish winners with right afterwards and you, you see that a few different times um and uh i know uh well, it's episode one they ended up uh promoting uh both sobel and winners at the same time basically yep and then he immediately gives him mess hall uh officer oh yeah and the first the first thing he does is tries to like sabotage him by turning the men against him basically they give him they give him the awesome meal of spaghetti which everybody loves and i'm sure he was saying that oh yep we're gonna have a nice easy day after this uh we're gonna go do some classroom instruction and uh right as they're they're kind of not not finished with the meal but have been scarfing it down for a little bit they end up bringing in captain sobel and he's like okay we're running we're running the hill yeah everybody let's go so they're just like chucking up spaghetti all the way up the hill um but even in that that moment uh they kind of they kind of have a really good uh bonding moment between the whole group of like we're not going to take your terrible leadership uh we can we can fight you off basically um and they they start singing singing as they're going up the hill and and helping each other out and and that right that's at the a end, huge moment right there where I think Sobel realizes it's kind of backfiring on him, yep. yeah, like they start singing, and he's like, "What the heck now I have a question about the whole spaghetti dinner thing, like do you guys do you think he had a method to his madness as with um with giving his men thinking it's going to be easy day and a nice meal. But then he's also supposed to be preparing these guys for war. And that's also learning how to deal with frustration and be, and thinking you have a plan and, you know, and it totally changes. Like that's also good leadership to do, to to train train that way. I think, do you think that was his method to his madness or was he just being a jerk? Well, I think, so that's, that's a great question. I was thinking about that this morning too, um, because like a lot of the things that Sobel does like in and of themselves, I can see a good leader doing that. Right. I can see like a good, uh, platoon instructor or, or, uh, you know, drill instructor, doing the same kind of stuff and it coming off amazing because you respect the guy. Right. But it's like, just like how he does it. I think he's not so much doing it or at least the way they portray it in the show, he's not really doing it to train the men. He's doing it to try to make the men hate the other guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, but, but you're right. Like a good leader could still tell him, Hey, eat up. We're going to have a light evening. And then at the end be like, psych, we're running the mountain. Right. And, and guys would be like, Let's do it. Bring it. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. Like that in and of itself is not what makes him, um, you know, a, a, t- a terrible leader. It's just kind of like how he does it. Yeah. Well, Which kind of even- gets to the point of leadership is an art. Right. There's not like this like black and white cut and dry formula for it. It's like you can kind of get it right, but you can mess it up with your your attitude. Yeah. What were you going to say, Tech? Even in uh, 
in the actual episode, they have Nick's a uh, conversation between Nick's and Winters where uh, Lieutenant Nix, who is one of the other platoon leaders, is like, yeah, Captain Sobel's a genius for right for this training um, process. Uh, and he's like, no. Winters is like, no. It, like, um, uh, these these Le- Leonardo da Vinci is a is a is a genius. Sobel's just being a dick. Like, <laughs> right, yeah, right, right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Nixon is like, oh, he's a genius. Uh, no, that's a that's a good point that's a good conversation and you know what i don't think i don't think they make a very big deal of this in the in the show i've seen episode one a couple times it's like a very subtle thing you kind of have to be looking for it but right after that spaghetti dinner you know they all take off out of the chow hall right and so they're they're booking it out of the chow hall and running up the mountain and it shows winter's the good leader standing there just kind of dumbfounded in the chow hall. Just like, I can't believe what just happened. Yeah. But then when the scene where it's showing them running and they're starting to sing, it shows winners in the run. Yeah. Yeah. It shows them in the group. It doesn't make a big deal out of it, but you do see when you see that scene, you're like, he was the last one out of the chow hall. And he has since gone to his barracks, changed clothes and is now, catching up to everybody and if you talk about like if there's anybody that could have gotten out of doing that run yeah he probably could have not even gone and nobody would have even noticed right oh i i was on kitchen duty i had to i had to clean up all this he had a great excuse if he wanted one yeah nobody told him that's right but he's like he sees his men running and he he's he's last one yeah gonna be way behind and uh and there he is so i love that scene that it shows oh man he he's here too Cause we had, I had a similar thing happen when, after my, after boot camp, the, one of the final things we do is called a, uh, crucible. And after the crucible, you're supposed to, everybody's supposed to get a warrior's breakfast. And that's when your warrior's breakfast is your first meal as a Marine. Cause you've gotten your Eagle Globe and anchor. So you're not like, it's not supposed to be fast. You can kind of relax a little bit. Um, you can eat as much as you want. This is what everything's supposed to be, you know, big is, celebration. Yeah. Big celebration. Like, okay, training's over. We're celebrating. Eating. So we go through and it's, you know, I'm like, oh, I can go back for seconds. That's the whole thing. Like you can go back for seconds. So I didn't take much. I was taking my time eating and, and like five, 10 minutes later, after I sit down, our drill instructors <laughs> around us, chewing us out. Let's go. Warrior breakfast is over. Training never stops. You know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> so I was like, what the heck? I was just so demoralized. But, uh, and I don't know why they did it. They probably miscalculated time. I don't know if they it were was behind for schedule. training. Yeah, they were probably behind schedule. It was probably a, that I'll never know. But training, you know, it's one of those things that taught me, like, you know, expect the unexpected. Never let your guard down. No. So, that's good. Yeah. That that warrior breakfast is that like right after your guys' longest ruck at the end? Yeah. I know because ours ours for army was right after our fourteen mile ruck and you kinda get home and well, yeah, home. It was only and, fourteen uh, miles? Dang. <laughs> fourteen sounds pretty long, Shadow. It, it's the difference between Marines, Army and Air Force, I guess. <laughs> so uh what have you seen personally from your your time in the army? Uh, what are some examples of good and bad leadership that when you were watching Band of Brothers, uh, you were reminded of? Did you have any moments where during the series you're like, "Oh, this reminds me of you know this this moment"? Yeah. Uh, honestly, I I had um, someone like Captain Sobel basically where, but it was it was a completely different circumstance. We had a, a uh, staff sergeant that then that ended up coming in and replacing uh, another staff sergeant that left up to Afghanistan. Um, so he came in about uh, a third of the way through, and so we were already established with what we're supposed to be doing, um, running our our operation for. Uh, we we basically were in Kuwait and. Uh, we had to track people going on R and R. We had to track units coming in and out of the country, uh, and, and set up training for them um, for our uh, our unit. Um, and as this guy came in, he wanted to show his leadership presence 
And of course, he wants to change things where we already have a smooth schedule going out. So he wanted to change up the schedule. Uh, he wanted to, to switch people around um, from nights to days to uh, kind of shake things up because he wanted it his way. Um, and uh, it it ended up. Uh, I had one incident where he witnessed something and wanted me to write a report on why this guy was disrespectful and I wasn't even there. So everything that I was supposed to write in there was coming directly from him. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. Uh, and, um, ended up, uh, seeing like quite a, quite a difference in, in the morale of, of everybody there. Cause I was basically second, second in charge as just a, a sergeant. And, um seeing how everybody was just exactly the way that unit was against Sobel like they they just did not like him at all um mm-hmm. uh, i ended up going to um our next step was uh sergeant first class and saying hey this sergeant that you brought in uh, he's he's just screwing with us um and it's just making everybody mad there's no there's no uh method to the madness that he's he's bringing i don't I don't know why he's doing it um and basically for the rest of uh the year that we were there he was just told to sit there and hang out and don't mess with anybody mm. um, so the rest of the time he just kind of hung out in the barracks uh had had no real real play in anything yeah so, he got sidelined that yeah that that kind of a flex, you yeah. know, I'm sure we've all seen that in leaders that want to like, as soon as they get to their, their new, their new unit, as soon as they're placed in charge or promoted, um, or take on a command bill, like they've, they feel this need to do a flex. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I'm curious cause your example is really unique. Why didn't that guy write the report himself? Why was, why was he having you write the report? Was that a separate flex going on? I, I, I really don't know why. Um, but, uh, there were, there were a couple other incidents where, uh, the two that ended up, uh, having the problem, uh, him and he was a, a specialist, uh, so E4. And they kind of, they kind of butted heads a couple of times. Um, but the, the whole thing was, um, he ended up saying that he, the guy that was in trouble, uh, left his post and then came back and was yelling at him uh, about um, leaving and and coming back. Which he he went to the gym halfway through a shift, just like he would normally do, uh, and he just didn't like that. I I honestly hmm. don't know why he wanted me to do it. I don't know if it was a a test to on loyalty or or what but yeah very well might have been i mean something if you're the if you're in charge and something bad happens or somebody screws up you you write the report that's that's kind of how it goes i've never heard of a a leader telling somebody else to write a report uh for something that they weren't even there for that's yeah that's pretty bad well even in uh episode one he's like hey i want six soldiers and their uh that's right yeah and their problems and yeah. your recommendation for uh basically reprimanding them mm-hmm. and i want it on my desk at zero one thirty or zero one mm-hmm. or whatever it was and he's like what what infractions find some yeah mm-hmm. and so i mean that's it, a good it, yeah. it, it goes really good into like well, what did what did you end up doing? That was a conversation later. What did you end up doing? Oh, I gave the people that had latrine duty, latrine duty, uh, <laughs> because it was their turn. And, and I, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he he found the infractions in the people who had to do that duty anyway. They yep. were they were the next in line. Yeah, very smart leadership move there. That was a good scene, and you realize then that the good leader Winters, um. He's kind of like standing in between his men and the and the toxic leader, and he never once loses his bearing, yeah. right? Like he he never mouths off to the bad leader because the bad leader is in charge of him. 
he just like Roger, Roger that to everything. And then he turns around to his men and he finds a way to like distribute it fairly and evenly and get the mission done. Yeah. Whether the mission is cleaning toilets or running a mountain or whatever, he's like, we're going to do it, but I'm not going to let you do it in the unfair way that you're trying to do it. Yeah. And that's some real next level leadership. When, when you were talking about changing things and flexing as soon as you get there, when I was stationed in Okinawa, uh, we were in a very small squadron and we were the only squadron in the air force, the whole air force. We were the only combined squadron with maintenance and flyers all together in the same squadron. I know the Navy does it that way, but that's a, that's an odd thing for the air force. And so you got, you know, all the mechanics and all the pilots and we're all in the same squadron. And it was a real fun, real, uh, tight knit unit. And, 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 you know, you're working with everybody you work with is in a different time zone from you. Kind of similar to this podcast today. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and we had a, a new guy came to the squadron and he shows up and he's full of, uh, bravado and ideas. And he's like, and he, he, he wasn't the commander. He, he was, he was just one of us. Uh, but he was a slightly higher rank than, than most of us. And, um, and he was just, you know, a real bull in a China shop. And I remember one of the guy, he was wanting to change everything like first week in the squadron. He was like, we're changing this and this is stupid. And I don't know why we do things this way. And we're going to start doing it this way. And I remember this other guy that had been there for years in the squadron. He goes, why don't you just take some time and be here for a little while and maybe understand why we do everything the way we do, get to know why we do things the way we do before you change it, because we might have a good reason that, yeah. that hasn't come up yet. You know, and I just remember hearing that uh, as being a fly on the wall in that room over here in that conversation, thinking this guy's got wisdom. Yeah. Right. There's no need to flex. Just slow down. And then years later, I'm in another unit in Georgia and um, I saw a new commander take over and he he was telling me in a, in a conversation, he goes, I'm not doing anything for the first several months. I'm going to spend the first several months in this command position, getting to understand how each squadron works and, and how each commander works. And I'm going to just spend a couple months just figuring out everything and then I'll really Right. get to work in a few months. And then that, that previous Okinawa conversation came back to my mind. And I was like, yeah. dude, this guy, this guy knows, you know, don't show up and, and flex. Have you guys, either of you ever seen or experienced someone who's a peer and then they move to being your superior and how, cause that can be challenging for some people to navigate that. Like, do they, ch have they changed completely and act like they got to be, you know, different than they were as your peer. That can be tough. Uh, I think Winders does that very well throughout the series because he, oh, you yeah. know, he goes up in rank and he doesn't ever, and even um, some of the other guys, like they're constantly, different guys are getting promoted. And I don't remember really any examples of anybody changing because of rank, you know, who they really were and how they did things. No, but that's a, that's a really good challenge for a lot of leaders. Yeah. I know uh, we, we've all seen that uh, kind of meme where it's like the leader is the guy that's alongside everybody and the boss is the one that's like, get to work. Uh, yeah, behind and, versus in front. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I, I've never really had instances of people passing me up. I've never been one that really wanted to be in a leadership role. I, I've, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't see it as something that I've wanted to do, uh, especially now where I work. Um, I can I can be a leader exactly where I'm at. I can influence uh, people and and instruct people exactly where I am. I don't have to be have a title to exactly do that. And yeah. um, so I've always I've always done it. And so I have, I have a bunch of managers that I actually trained as techs that are now managers above me and uh i mean the amount of uh respect that i showed them as a tech has transferred up to um them as managers now and so 
showing them re- the respect all the way through, they've they've been really good at like, okay, we we understand where your where your wisdom or where your your uh, attributes lie, um, and we're happy to to use you when whenever we can. Um, but we we respect the fact that you don't want to uh, play the political part of being a manager or one of the leaders. Yeah, man. I, I so get what you're saying. And, um, that kind of goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning of this podcast is like, I didn't even want to be a tribe leader. Um, I think that a lot of great leaders, uh, became leaders reluctantly. Um, and the reluctant leader mm-hmm. has something, um, very powerful on their side. It, and they're not, they're not, um, ambitious. Right. Yeah. By the way, you know, like uh, in modern culture, um, when we say that somebody's very ambitious, we tend to use that most often as a compliment about the person. But the real root word of the word ambitious is uh, that's an insult. That's a negative thing. As that word was created, the history behind it is it's something you don't want to be. It's person that's always like never content, always striving, always conniving, always listening, manipulating, trying to climb, climb, climb. And you're like, that's ambitious. And I know that now we use it as a, um, as a compliment, but the reluctant leader doesn't have to worry about that, right? He's going to do the best he can because he does the best he can at any job, right? You know, a reluctant leader, you could be told to, you know, clean a clean a bathroom or take out the trash and you're going to do a great job of that because you don't do anything halfway it's like whatever i do i'm going to do it well and then when you're put in charge if you carry that with you and i think that's what you see a lot of in band of brothers is these guys that they're not hungry for promotion and recognition and medals and glory they're just going to do the best they can and that is such an attractive quality in a leader and I've been in rooms before or in a group at work or some team that's created for something. And I'm like, okay, I do not want to be the leader in this group. I want to sit back and just fly under the radar. And I'm not trying to head this thing up kind of like you and men's Alliance in Oregon. Right. You're like, okay, I'll be on this team. uh, But somebody else needs to lead. And then, You're in that team, you're in that group, you're in that room for a while and nobody's stepping up Mm. and nobody's taking lead. And, and it starts to get so frustrating because you're in this group or you're on this team and nobody's leading and nobody's taking charge. And it feels like you're in a group that's just spinning its wheels. Yeah. And eventually you can't take it anymore and you go, okay, here's what we need to do. All right. Need somebody to, and it's just like, before you know it, you're the one with the marker at the whiteboard and you're coming up with a plan and you didn't want to be the leader, but you are a natural leader. And that's why we have Columbia tribe in Hermiston, Oregon. Right. And, and so I think that that's a great quality in a leader is um, kind of the lack of ambition. Yeah. Right. It's not the, it's not apathetic. It's not lazy. It's not unskilled. It's just. It's being a leader out of necessity. Leader out of necessity. I like that. Yeah, I know. I know a, a, a lot of times I've heard this uh, within our church from uh, one of our pastors. There is like, we don't we don't want to have to tell people what what needs to be done around the church, but if you see a need, fill that need. Uh, if you see that light bulbs are out somewhere in our church and and you want to get something done on that, just let us know. We'll we'll come and let you work on the church. Um, and I, I've seen it plenty of times and and then used it other places of like hey i i know you're saying that there's uh a bunch of broken stuff over here in in the shop uh you don't have to have somebody else go do that you can you can take care of that i i believe mm-hmm. in you. <laughs> that's great yeah a leader just sees what needs to be done and then just does it yeah um so in episode two Oof. they've finished their training and they're not in georgia anymore and they're they're uh, they've they've sailed across the ocean. They're in England, but they're still training. They're yep. they're in England. They're doing all this training, and there's some really great. There's some fun scenes in that episode, and you know they're all nervous. They keep hearing talk about 
an invasion and they know that it's only a matter of time they're in war they're overseas but they're not yet in combat they're they're in the the hillsides of england and they're just training every day and this is where you start to see the wheels fall off of captain sobel yep the guy who was the real hard ass when they were going through training now he's about to jump into d-day with them and during these training exercises in england there's this in, incredible scene where they realize he's not very technically proficient at his at his craft so at his funny. job right yeah. he's really good at yelling and screaming and giving demerits and making people run but when he's out in the field with a map and a compass he gets everybody lost yeah you remember this scene yes. really jumpy it's just yeah <laughs> And so it's the same person that I was talking about earlier. It's just so funny. There's this, there's this, there's this moment where it's almost. I'm going to describe a scene in the sh in the in the show that doesn't happen. Here's a scene that never happens. Um, he's got his whole group of men because he's in charge. He's got this whole group of these um, the these um enlisted soldiers and NCOs all around him. And he's in charge and he's holding the map and he's holding the compass and he's lost. And here's the scene that doesn't happen. Somebody helps him. That never happens. He gets no help from his men and he asks for no help from his men. They neither volunteer it yeah. and he doesn't turn around and ask for it. And to me, that it was the most striking thing about that scene. I'm like, it would be one thing if he was alone, right? If they sent like one guy with a map and compass and he got lost, that'd be a different scene. But he's standing there surrounded by his troops. He's got guys all around him and they're all just, they're, they are mentally checked out. They don't even care about this training exercise. They're just smoking and joking and they're just laughing at him and watching him fail. And for one thing, if he was a good leader, he would turn around and say, hey guys, I'm lost. I need some help. Who knows where we are? Does anybody know where we are? Or does anybody know how to read this map? Get up here. Help me out. That's what a good leader would, would have done in that situation. But if he would have been a good leader all along, he would have already had them standing there doing that without even asking. He would have had those guys coming up to him being like, hey, Captain, I know where we are. Let me see that map. Let me help us out. And because he has this track record of just being you know, a toxic leader, and punishing. When it comes his, when he's flailing now, people are just happy to watch him drown, yeah. and he's not even smart enough to turn around and ask for help. So it makes me think of our creed, right? I'm not too proud to ask for help. Here's this leader about to jump into combat with these guys. He's lost, and he can't even turn around and say, "Who, who knows where we are? Who can help me read this map?" He's so nervous and so on edge. It's just so funny because. We, you know, in my own experience, that same leader I was talking about earlier, we're going through shoot house training, close quarter combat, and it's our, our qual day. So we've had like a week of clearing houses and being in the kill house and the shoot house. And you have to, in order to do, to get, you know, to go through it for real, you eventually work your way up to live fire. So it's not just like um, simulation anymore. Well, he's so bad that he gets blue barreled, which is he can't go through with ammunition in his gun. Mm. So he's our leader, you know, and he's, we're all doing it for oh, real. Man. And he's having to say pew, pew, you know, when <laughs> they, give just, him, they give him the they rubber give, gun, yeah, they give him the rubber gun. I mean, it was just hilarious. Of course, nobody says anything, you know, to his face, but you can just tell the look on his face. It was just so just that, those same mannerisms and being really ner like he's a nurse. He was so nervous to go through, to go through all that kind of training just because he didn't know what he was doing. You know, in the, in the band of brothers show, um, there's so much pride. I don't think we can yeah. talk about Sobel in this scene right. without pride. That's what keeps him from asking for help. Yeah. And that's why he's so stressed during that scene. Yeah. And he's just freaking out because his image is starting to unravel in front right. of his guys. Right. And, he, and he's too proud. And that really what it comes down to is a good leader is humble. A good what leader that? knows that they're not the best at everything. I'm not the best at, at, you know, this exercise we're currently doing. Is there anybody who knows how to do it? But, um, 
the prideful leader will never do that. They think they have to be the best at it. And it eventually is their very downfall. I think there's just a lack of maturity too. You know, it's like, it takes a level of maturity to, to realize and be okay with people knowing that you don't know everything. And also we get to see later on the exact opposite of that. So as they actually land towards the end of it, you have uh, Lieutenant Winters who actually is lost, has no weapon. Uh, mm. And is with just that one private hall where he's still uh, just showing his, his confidence and instilling that confidence in those around him where he's like, uh, hey, just uh, keep an eye out. We, we don't really know where we are. Look for any kind of landmarks, uh, streets, That's right. uh, buildings. Uh, and then he, he goes off the list and it's like, and trees. And, you know, kind of breaking the, the, uh, act, the, the terrified private into kind of a, a laugh of calming him down and, and bringing him back to like, hey, we're, we're in this together. Um, we're going to get through this and, and being able to show that, that uh, confidence that, hey, we've, we've got a mission to do and we're going to get it through, get done with it. Um, is such is a good, example. good point. I yeah. love how you, you, you brought up the humor part, right? And, and throughout the whole first two episodes and really the whole series, Winters is not a funny guy. Nope. Right. I mean, he's not a joker. He's not funny. He's always very serious, but he very strategically uses that joke right there. He cracks a joke with that guy and it just breaks the tension. I mean, they're, and that's so that's so amazing too how you think about they're off course they were dropped who knows where they're nowhere near their drop zone and he loses his unit. weapon yeah he's like he has no weapon no idea where he is and 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 off course and none of his men and he finds one guy that's not even in his unit and he immediately connects with that guy and he's humble and he's like I don't know where we are I don't have a weapon um Let's let's me and you start walking and let's figure this out. He he yeah. he does have one other line in there uh, where the private's like, "Are we lost?" He's like, "No, we're in Normandy. Know exactly where we are." <laughs> yeah, uh, that's good. So that was that was a really good one. Yeah, great leadership, and you see you see that so well contrasted between yeah when he jumps into combat and then when Sobel is in lost in the cow pasture. Hey guys, is money holding you back from being used by God? If finances are a problem in your life and you're looking for some help, some counsel, some assistance financially, you've got to check out the Main Street Group. It's run by Tom Love, call sign Doc with Tuckahoe Tribe. Okay, Doc is a certified financial planner. He's a fee-only fiduciary. He's a Dave Ramsey Smart Vester Pro. He uses Charles Schwab Assets. He will help get you on course in ways that you didn't even know you were off course. He's not just a sponsor of the podcast, but my wife Carrie and I, we use him for our finances personally. He's helped us a ton. He's been ranked number two in the Richmond Times Dispatch, number one in Style Weekly. He's a top 40, under 40 investor. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes. He is the man to see to get you on course financially. God saved Tom spiritually and physically and god is the reason for tom's success and he wants to help others succeed also so whenever you go see tom love aka doc don't forget to mention that you are a part of men's alliance and he will donate your first year of fees back to men's alliance nonprofit 501c3 so he's not only helping you but he's helping our ministry as well so do yourself a favor go see the main street group with Tom Love. It's in the show notes. Check it out. And as always, Dave Ramsey and Charles Schwab are separate entities and past performance is no guarantee of future results. Check him out. The Main Street Group, Tom Love. Last last question as we start to land this plane. Um, what are some ways that you guys, uh, Tech and Shadow, what are some ways that you guys see these leadership lessons that we've just talked about from one and two um, how can we apply these as leaders in our home or in our jobs or in our tribes? There's just 
so much to be learned from, you know, sometimes we think we can only learn from good leadership. There's so much to be learned from bad leadership. <laughs> Ain't you know? that the truth? Because it's like, you know, you, you should be thankful. If you're in a time right now where you have, you know, bad leadership in whatever, you know, in, in whatever job you're in or whatever, just look on it as you're still learning from this person. You're learning what not to do, what you never want to do. If you're ever in that position, it'd make you be a better leader at home. Cause you know, you definitely don't want to be like that. Um, so I think becoming a good leader is a good leader is someone who's had great leadership and someone who's had really bad leadership. I'll say something to that. Yeah. Um, knowing like to the, to your point about seeing examples of what you don't want to do. Yeah. Knowing all the different ways you can fail right. is super important yeah. to any job. Like if I'm doing any kind of job, I want to know what are the ways that this could be really messed up, yeah, <laughs> right? right? And then I know to avoid those. And as a leader, if you see, okay, what are the ways to be a really bad leader? Yeah. How can a person become a terrible leader? Give me that checklist so that I can avoid it. Well, you, yeah. can, be, you can have pride. Right. Um, you can be petty jealous, vindictive, never yeah. ask for help. Okay, good list. I will avoid all those things. It reminds me, the very first day at Navigator School in the Air Force, back when Nav School used to be in San Antonio, the first day of school, they showed us first class. We're all sitting down. Okay, here we go. We don't know what we're about to learn. We're embarking on this. We sat there and we watched about probably like a 45-minute long video of just clips one after another of planes crashing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were watching helicopters crashing, yep. planes falling off the side of carriers, yep. um, midair collisions. We're just watching just crash after crash after crash. And after a while, it's like, man, what are they doing to us? Yeah. Right. And, um, and that was, that was impactful. And then they got up there at the end of the, the, the video and they were, they were like, Look around this room. A lot of you aren't going to be here in a few years. Um, if you if you screw up at what we're here to teach you, you're going to be on one of these highlight films. Yeah, and and that just really hit me. I was like, man, this is for real, right? And there's a lot of ways to mess up. And one of the ways that I've always thought in my in my life uh, since since being a nav is. Where is the highest terrain, right? I think we, we, we've done a podcast on this, on high terrain, but like know like what is the mountaintop that you are most likely in your life to crash into? What is it? Identify it. Is it, uh, you know, alcohol? Is it pornography? What, what is the thing that has the most likelihood of crashing you as a leader? Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's... Uh, technical incompetence or whatever and like fix that thing that could derail you yeah um look for ways that you could fail i remember remember when motivational posters were really big in squadrons yeah. and like banks and everywhere you'd go they They're would have those, up, up, those big signs and it would say like success yeah they would have like a cheesy I just picture. made a joke about Perfect that at one of our meetings i was like i love all these pictures they just motivate the crap yeah motivation <laughs> Well, I remember one that we had in a squadron I was in, and it was a picture of a plane crashing. And it said, like, perspective. Yeah. And then in the fine print, it said, it could be that the entire purpose of your life is to show others what not to do. Oh, wow. <laughs> you yeah. like, die laughing. You're like, yeah. that is super depressing. Yeah. But I do think there's a lot to be learned yeah. from, okay, what, what do I want to not do? Yeah. Can you imagine if that was God's purpose for your life? <laughs> oh, I, I I pray that it's not. Please, God. Well, I mean, even uh, even David had uh, plenty of yeah. plenty of places where he hey, was shown what. That's not, a great point. Like this is what you don't do, but you can return yeah. from it. Yeah, that's a great that's point, a great right? Point. So, so even if we do royally crash into a mountain, you get back up. That's right. You get back up when the world knocks us down. Get back up again. Don't let that define you. You know, you think about this too. Throughout Band of Brothers, there's a million moments that come and go that Sobel could have uh, vindicated himself. Yeah. He could have turned things around. He could have changed. There's, he's got opportunity after opportunity. 
to fix things at any moment that character could have could have gone to winners and said hey man listen i've i've been a real jerk and i want to fix things yep. right he could have fixed it it's not like we're set in tracks that that's yeah. how we're going to be forever well even even trying to accept some of winners uh uh perspective on when they were in that foxhole like hey we're we're in the per- the textbook uh ambush position we need to stay right here oh, yeah. and then they oh, walk yeah. out of that foxhole and just 95 percent of their unit dies right there um yeah what an incredible example when they're in that they're in the forest doing training and he, he just doesn't listen I, I i do want to really bring up one of the the great leadership ones um where all of the ncos oh yeah they they're sitting around that table and I mean, you can, you might think that it's, it's just about them. Like they don't want to go in and follow this guy into battle because they're going to die. But they're also like, they have relationships with all of their soldiers underneath them. Like you're mm-hmm. living with these guys day in and day out and you want to do everything you can to protect them and to guide them. And so as all of them sit there together, hoping that this one thing that they're going to do that they, they could be shot for. I mean, they, they talk about this, like, Hey, we could be lined up against the wall and shot for this. Uh, yep. and yeah, different, different time, different army. Uh, but they, they realize how, how their decision could completely get them killed right there. So it's not only about them. They, they are doing this for their entire unit behind them. And they, they resign their, their non-commissioned officer, uh, rank in mm-hmm. order to send a very big sign that, Hey, this guy is not someone we want to follow. Yeah. So the scene, the scene tech is uh, referring to it's all the NCOs. They walk into the Colonel's office, you know, they go above everybody. They all go to the Colonel and they all lay their stripes down on his desk. And they're like, we are not going in to battle with that leader. It doesn't work. Right. It no, does. it does. Oh, it does. It does. He still punishes them all for that. Okay. You know, he's a great colonel in that yeah. in the series too, right? He has a lot of wisdom. When people come to him and tell him different things, he's, you know, he's got to sift through what's what's accurate and what's just their their opinion. And he does that, and he he punishes all those NCOs. I can't remember what it is. It's like he docks some pay or some stripes yeah. or something. He he drops them all down to uh to private again. Uh, yeah. One guy he ends up sending to another, like to a completely different unit. Um, but yeah. So they do pay for their move, but at the same time, when they leave that office, he it resonates so strongly with him. Like these guys just went and fell on their sword for this, uh, and he does listen to him too. And that's a so then that's the next great scene, right? I don't know if you wanted to talk about that when he, when the colonels got Sobel in his office. I I think even before that, it shows the respect that those men, those non-commissioned officers have for winners as they walk out of the colonel's office. Oh yeah, that's right. What they've just done. Winners doesn't know it. I'm sure at some point they were told, but uh, come out and, and salute winners. Like, Hey, we, we laid it all on the line for you because you're being punished or something that shouldn't have even happened. And, you know, I think in that scene, that's a very powerful scene as they walk past each other. I think Winters knows what they've done because he sees two things. He sees that they've, none of them are wearing their stripes. Like they're all, all, he's like looking at their uniforms and he's looking at the office they just came out of. And there's just like that little moment, nothing said, but he just looks. And I, I always, I think I'm like, he, he figured it out. He knows what just happened in there or he has a pretty good hunch. Yeah. So very powerful scene about that's a group leading when they're not in charge. Right. Yeah. And, um, that's one of my favorite leadership books. It's actually on our, um, our MA reading list is the book called how to lead when you're not in charge, um, by Clay Scroggins. And, it talks about how you can lead even when you don't have the title, when you don't have the, when you're not the commander, because men follow leaders. They don't follow titles and and rank. They they will to a certain point. But as you see in that scene, 
everybody has their limit yeah. and those guys hit a certain point and they're like, okay, we've been taking this for a long time and we're, we're done. Yeah. Very good scene. All right. So what are uh, a, a couple more? I know you had a few other leadership uh, lessons that you wanted to convey from these episodes. Um, so one of the, the really terrible examples of bad leadership uh, was as they're assaulting the final cannon in uh, uh, the D-Day episode, they end up, uh, Lieutenant Spears from another company ends up joining them, bringing them mm -hmm. a bunch of ammo that they really needed, they were running out of, which was awesome. But then he asked permission to assault that final cannon uh, to, I don't know if it's to win recognition for himself or or what, but as he's doing it, he's further back in the uh, the group of, of guys that's running after this cannon, and they end up leaving, um, not, not a canal, but leaving that uh, dug-in position. He runs up and out of there, and his men end up following him up and out of the protected position, and the majority of his men end up getting shot right there as he's running out along there. Somehow he makes it and wins that recognition of uh, uh, taking over that final cannon and destroying everybody. But he was the last one standing. And in that that uh, scene, you actually see a flash over to Winters going, oh, no, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? Hmm. What do you think he should have done? Well, if he wasn't so eager to, uh, I, I think, win that recognition or, or make a name for himself at the very beginning, uh, he should have kept down into the canals or, um, and basically followed the, the lead man that was already in front instead of coming up out and, and taking it slow like they were doing with the other three cannons. It doesn't have to be a, a rush to, the, to get it done immediately. Um, Make sure you're you're yeah. you're taking in all the uh, all the different um, scenarios that could happen, and and doing it safely, keeping your men alive. Just being methodical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So as a leader, sometimes you can just be uh, too headstrong, moving too fast, and faster than your guys, and faster than your plan, right? Can keep yep. up with you. Can kind of just be that that lone wolf out there. Which yeah. in this case winds up getting a lot of people killed. Yeah, I think what um, that's a good good example of what we call the barn door mentality. It's when you see, oh, this is the last thing I have to do, and everything just fades out. All you can see is those big barn door, barn door, uh, wide open doors, and you just run right to it, and you're not paying attention to everything around you, and everybody behind you or beside you gets killed because you weren't have a good picture of everything that's still going on because you can actually see the finish line. Once you can see the finish line, it's sometimes it, everything just blurs out and you forget procedure and um, tactics and you just go f full headstrong and it gets people killed, like you said. One of the things I really admire in this series about Winters is how calm and methodical he always is. Yeah, um, He's never, and there is one great scene that we'll talk about another day, there is a great scene where he does kind of break his own character and uh and he 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 kind of leads a, a charge but for the most part he's very methodical, very calm, very measured. Yeah. Um and I I admire that about him. So that's something that I'm not that I'm I've been working on for a while. So one of the things I thought I would share is one of the things that we do in a carry the fire patch class is we give each other feedback. And so you got to go through and you've got to give each guy in your class, you have to give him a strength and you have to give him a blind spot. And that is so powerful when, when, a, when a group of guys that you respect and that, that you know, and they know you really well, when they tell you, here's one of your blind spots, here's something you could do better. Um, that is very powerful. So I wanted to share one of mine. 
everybody wrote the same thing about me. And I think, you know, when you get a bunch of feedback from people, you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt, right? Because there's probably going to be, you know, in, if 10 guys give you feedback, there's probably going to be one guy out of 10 that thinks you're amazing and you mm -hmm. never screw up. And he says, man, you, I can't think of anything to tell you. You're right. just awesome. And then there's going to be one guy and he's like, uh, you suck at everything. Here's <laughs> here's a hundred things you can prove. So you kind of throw out the top one and you kind of throw out the bottom one. And then you're like, okay, what are the other eight guys saying? And I think, you know, that's an important way to understand feedback is don't take the extremes. But if you've got five guys and we did ours in patch class 01, it was on note cards. We were yeah. using three by five cards. Right. Now we do it online. But um, I kept these three by five cards and I read them um, regularly for about a year. And the thing that I got over and over that everybody told me is um, when you have a decision to make, slow down and take in more people's input. They all said something to that effect, right? Like, don't be so quick to make a decision without asking us first. Something like that, right? You just see the same thing. You're going through these cards. You're like, oh, dang. Okay. I must, that must be true. That must be a blind spot. Right. And so your, your example there, tech of spears taking off and charging up and guys are getting shot behind them trying to keep up. I can see that. I'm like, yeah, that's probably the mistake I would make, you know? And the, and then the, the more mature leaders would be like, you know, maybe you should have just talked over this plan for a second. Right. But, but I'm sure the spears would say, Oh, you guys are slow. You're never going to get anything done. I'm here to win this war. Right. We can paint it to make ourselves look like, like we're doing it right. Even when we're not, that's where this self-awareness is really important and, and asking for feedback and, and being able to, to take feedback and criticism and, uh, and, and change accordingly as needed. Each yeah. year we go through a feedback process where I work. Um, and one of the things that I tell people when they're, they're giving me feedback or I, I have to go out and request it from people. I tell them, be brutal. Like, I mean, yeah. you want to be nice to your coworkers and everything, but if if you give them the the permission to be brutal, I I can't change what I don't know uh, that I'm failing at. So be brutal with your your uh, feedback for me, because I want I want to know what I need to change to to be a better person. So so good, you know. That's a scary think, thing to ask, though. Uh, my my time uh, fl flying in the Air Force. Uh, I saw the tremendous value of the debrief. You don't have a flight ever that doesn't have a debrief from, you know, a little training flight um, to, you know, a combat mission. There's always a debrief in it. And, and I think that's something about every high performing group in the military has ruthless debriefs where you sit down, even after a great mission, you can find something that you did wrong in even the best mission. Yeah. Um, be like, well, what's something we could do better? And we're not leaving this room until you tell me something that I screwed up on. Yeah. And that's how you get better. That's how you grow. You don't get, you don't improve um, with high fives. Yep. Yeah. They're fun, but okay. So I know you got one last uh, leadership example that you wanted to bring up. Yeah. I, I think right at the end, I know an absolute awesome example of of leadership for for us is uh, realizing that there there is a higher power. God is in control of everything. And at the very end of D Day, after losing his first soldier, and and realizing how how bad it could be, um, uh, Lieutenant Winters ends up uh, praying, and he. I think this is one of the very few times if not the only time in, in the series where he mentions God, even though everybody in his unit uh, thinks that he's uh, a Quaker or the, the perfect, yeah, that's right. The perfect yeah. example of everything doesn't drink, doesn't crack jokes. Um, his all business all the time. Um, he then uh, turns to God and says, Lord, just if you can get me through this, uh, I know I'm basically, I know I'm going to do some terrible things throughout this. Um, but if you can get me through this, uh, I promise you that 
I will come home and live a life of peace uh, in, in Pennsylvania, basically. And, you know, all, all the way at the end, they end up saying that he does exactly that. But mm. uh, that his, his promise and his reckoning with God, like, Lord, just get me through this. I love it. Man, that was awesome. Well, dude, this has been such a cool conversation. Yeah. Part one of Leadership Lessons from Band of Brothers. Uh, Tech, I've really enjoyed um, chatting with you and hearing hearing what stood out to you as good and bad examples. And um, Shadow, I think uh, this is going to be one of the most important series we do because such an element of Men's Alliance is leadership. And we have so many guys start in a tribe that they've never led anything. And leading that first workout or the first devotion really terrifies them. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that makes Men's Alliance great is we grow leaders. And I've seen a guy lead his first devotion, and he had the entire thing on a printed piece of paper. He just <laughs> typed it out, printed it, and showed up. And he just read it. And, you know, the, the win there, the victory is that he did it. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good it was. Uh, he led a devotion. He just right. led his first devotion. And you know what? Um, a couple months later, I saw that guy lead another devotion, and he wasn't reading it. Yeah. And then several months after that, he led another devotion. And it was honestly, it was one of the best devotions I've ever heard around right. a fire. So. I, I love the that we're growing leaders and the topic of leadership is so important for us. And uh, what more fun way to do it than to talk about Band of Brothers? Uh, yeah. I kind of like, as you're saying, like you can see the the progression. I, I kind of want to share a little bit, like, even though I, I started Dude. the tribe here in, in Hermiston, um, I, I was, I was scared to like my first um, time to even lead anything was with men's alliance uh, I've, I've never led a mm. bible study or anything um in, or anything in the church really uh so my first time getting up and stay on stage and saying hey we're we're starting a men's group here called men's alliance uh just getting up there and feeling my heart like oh I, I, I don't want to be in front of all these people uh yeah and then getting to uh my first devotional i, I had exactly that i had it all printed out and i read it I, I couldn't even read it. I got so jumpy and jittery uh, being in front of all these guys. Um, I I ended up mixing up my words and I'm like, okay, um, give me, guys, give me a second. I got to breathe. I got to calm down a little bit. I'm, yeah. I'm, you find yourself coming out of, getting out of breath, yeah. just reading something. And yeah. uh, then getting to a point where I, I'd print out a couple paragraphs uh, with with some verses that I wanted to highlight. And kind of reading through those, and and then turning it out for the questions, uh, up into the the last devotion that I led, uh, I had two pages uh, in my my small little notebook here that were kind of written out where I'm skipping lines and stuff, and I think I got through a third of the first page before the half hour is up, and realizing oh man i I've, I've got basically a whole nother devotion here that we, oh yeah we, yeah. we gotta talk about that happens time. all the time yeah that happens all the time guys always over plan the amount of material yeah. for their devotions and you hear guys say well we're about out of time i've still got like a couple pages yeah. let me just try to get through real quick you're like no no, no stop save that's, that for next week yep. <laughs> that's great because it usually means that you've asked good questions you're getting a lot of feedback and a lot of interaction yep. and you can't get to your next if you can't get to your next point because there's so much interaction and people are engaged and talking. That's awesome. That is perfect. Save your next point for another week. That's right. Don't, your don't next be point like, is not really important. Wanted, don't ever <laughs> cut people off yep. and be like, uh, well, let me get to my next point. Let them talk. You know, the, the best devotion is so letting true. other people talk. I'm, so true. I've, got, I've had a point bunch of times where yeah. I'm like, hey, I, I really want to just, I wanted to end with this verse. So please go. Right. I, I put it in the group chat afterwards. Hey, please go read this part of it. Uh, sometimes yeah. throughout yeah. this week and, and kind of reflect on That's it. That's good. Yeah. But. So with that, that moment you were talking about being nervous, uh, that was up at the front of your church. Um, was, was cookie with you? Yeah. Yeah. So I saw that video. 
that, that I've was seen that the, video. That was actually the second time. Um, oh, that was the second one. Okay, the second time being up there. Uh, I'm I'm still not great in front of a bunch of people. I get real <laughs> well, real jittery. <laughs> I would have never guessed. What I wanted to tell you is when I watched that video, I'm like, I mean, it looks like a couple of like seasoned public speakers on stage talking about men's alliance. That's what I saw. And so it's funny to hear you say now that you were, you were nervous because it never, it never comes across. Um, but I think that that's awesome for you to share. I'm, I'm so glad other guys are hearing this is that you were nervous <laughs> and you're the guy that started the tribe and up in front of your whole church talking about, Oh, it. is that the one where he's on stage talking? Oh, about yeah. I'm yeah. scared every yeah. time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was great. I am too. I am too. I uh, there's something to me about a stage. There's something yeah. about the elevation. Yep. Like you could put like 500 men in front of me, and I don't get nervous talking to them. If we're standing on the ground outside around a fire, I get no nerves. But if we're indoors and I step up on a on a two foot high stage, yeah, <laughs> like all of a sudden I'm nervous. See You're the like, top of their what the heck yeah. just happened? How did I get nervous? And, 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 and the same thing is true when you stand on the tire. Yep. That's exactly you step it. up on the tire and now say the creed. You're yeah. like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder up there. Oh, All man. right. Well, this has been awesome, man. Do either of you guys have any no. parting shots here? I thought that was great. We wrap up episodes one and two well. Yeah, I think so. I think we got just about everything. Let me check my old notebook one more time. <laughs> yeah, if there's if there's a big nugget we missed, let us know. Oh, I, I so I, I I was hesitating to to say this one um, because it's it's then later um, I don't I can't remember what episode it is uh, later on where it kind of relates to this but as Sobel's leaving and Winters kind of salutes him and he he drives off and he doesn't return the salute oh yeah but then later oh, in the yeah. later episode just make sure you guys cover that when it comes to that episode and I, I can I can leave it alone here. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's that's a huge factor that connects, you know, the beginning and the end. Yeah. Hey, we 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 don't salute the man, we salute the rank. Uh yeah, at the end, yep. Winters outranks Sobel. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. And just the that's total disrespect of him again. and the pride of being shipped off and knowing that Winters is probably gonna take over his company. Um yep. I know that, that, yeah. that probably hurts Sobel pretty bad. And just yeah. the utter disrespect to not even return his salute as he's leaving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the best, uh, I think, truest quotes I've heard from somebody famous is a man doesn't know who he truly is until he's given leadership or his life is threatened. And uh, I just always have found that so, like so true. Cause, and that's another, like, someone, has, if he's a bad leader, you know, that's who he, it shows you you show your true colors i know i'm stumbling through right this. yeah when people but, get people yeah. get power or money or or leadership position right, right? that's where you really find out like kind of like what they're made of yep man so true so many good lessons here i loved this whole conversation uh from band of brothers episodes one and two a lot of good leadership stuff in there next up stay tuned for leadership lessons from band of brothers uh the second one that we're going to do, we're going to hear from Breach, tribe leader out of Maryland, Be More Tribe. And um, no, actually, he's Chainbreaker Tribe, Chainbreaker Tribe, another Maryland tribe. So we're going to hear from Breach talking about episodes three and four and more leadership lessons that we can take out of those. So don't miss that one. And see you guys around the fire. Thanks for listening to the Men's Alliance podcast. We hope to see you in one of our tribes or at one of our unforgettable weekend experiences. So join us at mensalliancetribe.com. When I get old enough, I'll, I'm going to become player chief. Oh, fire chief? No. no. Player oh, chief. Player what? chief. Prayer chief. Prayer chief. Dude, that is awesome. You're three. Yeah, three. Un unofficially, like uh, this. This guy is my little prayer warrior, and uh, I, I said I've told him plenty of times, like, "Hey, I, I know you can't come to the workout, uh, but 
you're you're definitely our prayer chief that is That's so awesome. important well you know what guys can i ask you to do me a favor what will you guys pray for me and pray for all of men's alliance because we need some prayer chiefs like you 